I just want to say welcome to everybody. Welcome to Alihopa. It's a uh, it's an incredible joy and an honor and uh, to have the guest we have today. And I'm gonna leave it to Fredrik to present him because uh, Fredrik has known him for a large number of years. And everybody here, I assume, has has heard and known and read of his things. So, having said that, hjärtligt välkomna en i föreningen i Sverige. Det är en ära att få presentera Dr. Bandley. It's an honor to present this. So, Fredrik, take it. Yes. So I've had the privilege to be trained by this man for over 10 years now. Uh, as you all know, he's the co-creator of NLP. He has authored numer numerous of books, including uh, Get the Life You Want, which is one of my favorites, and also Rich Bendler's Guide to Transformations and The Secrets of Being Happy. And He's continued to develop NLP as well as new technologies for human change for the past 50 years now. But I think in his own words, he says, it's just getting warmed up. And he told us right now he was born ready. So, <laughs> so it's a great honor for me to present one of the great geniuses of our, our time. So the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Richard Bandler, welcome. Well, it's nice to be here especially given the alternative. <laughs> yeah. During Corona, we've had to get used to do things online. Uh, do you have any views of doing NLP coaching clients and, and things like that online? Well, uh, I, have, I have the view that uh, it's harder, uh, but it's not certainly not impossible. And uh, I've done, I've had clients online. I've done certainly a lot of trainings online that I would have never done. I don't believe you can train an adequate practitioner online. Uh, this is a discussion that's been going on way before Corona that, you know, people come to me and say, you know, I did a seven day practitioner course online and I would go, yeah, but unfortunately you're not working with other people. You're not doing the exercises. A big part of NLP is learning to see and hear and uh, to use what you see and hear to change your internal state, to change other people's internal state. And uh, while you can teach a lot of it online, most of the people that, that I have as trainers like yourself have done part of the training they can do online. And then when this all ends are gonna have provisional practitioners come back and pick up the rest because you have to tune up your senses, you have to tune up your hearing, you, and some of that you can do online and some of that you have to do face to face. You know, uh, you can't sit in a room by yourself and learn to be a good hypnotist. That's just not the way it works. You can't sit in your room and learn to be a good neuro-linguistic programmer because there's nobody else there. And oh. if you don't practice, you don't get good at things. That'd be like trying to learn to be a great musician without an instrument or a great surgeon without practicing. Uh, now for surgeons, they actually make uh, realistic 3D hearts and then you can go and operate on the heart and it's just like a real heart. So you don't have to kill a lot of people to get good at it. And the truth is, uh, as I've been telling psychotherapists for 50 years, you know, it, it, you can make people worse. A lot of the clients that came to me over the 50 years were screwed up. They started out with problems and ended up getting much worse because of the intervention of a psychiatrist or the intervention of a psychotherapist. I do love that name, psychotherapist, and uh, and 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 neurolinguistic programmers. I've had people that uh, I had a really quite famous artist come to me and he couldn't paint anymore, and he'd gone in with some problem and. Uh, inadvertently somebody who was supposed to be uh, a good neuro-linguistic programmer, they weren't one of mine, but they were somebody that had gone off on their own and decided they were an expert. And they had literally killed the guy's inability to, to, to use his motivation strategy to be able to paint. And I had to go in and reconstruct it because he had looped it on itself so that while the guy didn't have anxiety in his life, He also didn't have much of anything else either. Uh, he, he wasn't stressed out, but he wasn't painting. He wasn't creating. He, uh, you know, he wasn't doing much of anything. And uh, when he came to see me, he, he thought it was a problem. 
uh, that, you know, he had created himself. And the more I talked to him, I realized it was just a bad piece of work. That somebody who, you know, had powerful tools, didn't know what they were using. Remember, a, a hammer can build a house, but it can also crack somebody's head open. Uh, the tools are just tools. And, you know, a lot of times over the years, when I started out, you know, psychotherapists would come to class and they would go, isn't all of this very manipulative? And I would go, well, that's a bad word to you because you use it idiomatically. I said, to manipulate means to move something from one place to another on purpose. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, I, I have to admit, I do manipulate my clients into being happier, healthier, more productive, uh, having greater desire, uh, rather than leave them all screwed up. And, you know, there was a, a book that came out uh, written many years ago that called Don't Push the River. And, uh, and actually it said, you can't push the river, uh, meaning that you can't force somebody into a, you know, to change. And uh, that's not accurate. Uh, you can push rivers, it's called plumbing. And uh, if we didn't push rivers around, we wouldn't have toilets in our house. Progress is where we harness the forces of nature and naturally occurring things. NLP is about harnessing the miracle that is our neurology. Our brains have as many neurons in it as there are stars in the sky. And each one of those is talking to 10 to 100 other neurons. So the ability to think is limitless. Now, that can be a good thing, but it can also be a really terrible thing that many people to use their brain to torture themselves. They create uh, neural pathways that loop and loop and loop and bring up horrible memories over and over again. Uh, soldiers relive traumatic experiences to the point where they can't hold a job and work. I've done a lot of work with veterans in this country. And I, I, you know, I used to work with the military to do training about flying helicopters and sonar and designing better, faster training programs. But I could never convince them that you need a training program to come home just as much as you need to leave. They bring them back and assign them some kind of psychotherapist, you know, who's still reading Fritz Perls and Maslow and uh, Carl Rogers, and they're not equipped to deal with somebody that's just had uh, you know, three of their closest comrades' brains blown all over their clothes. Uh, you know, that uh, our job is to deal with the hardest things in the world and to make it so they're not. And in, in NLP, we look at truth as being a powerful tool. And uh, instead of, you know, getting into how people really feel, we want them to feel the best they can and to cope the best they can. We look at the people that, that achieve or survive the worst things in the world. I studied the people who went through the Holocaust to, to discover how to get people over bad memories and how to be happier. And some of the Holocaust victims were some of the happiest people I met. And some of them were still stuck back in that concentration camp and relived it every day, that their life was a living nightmare. And the difference between those and knowing the difference about how to think successfully is the job of a neurolinguistic programmer. We, you know, where psychotherapy goes on an archeological dig uh, many times into people's past to try to find out why they are the way they are, especially 50 years ago, it's gotten much better through the decades. Uh, a lot of my work has been adapted into modern psychology. Uh, they may call it cognitive psychology, but I still know what it is. Uh, you know, and that's not a bad thing. NLP has been adopted into modern sales training, into modern intelligence training, into modern police work. And uh, you know, uh, people are always coming to me and showing me a manual from some place, a training thing in a police force and going, this is your stuff. And I go, yes. And they go, they go, you're being ripped off. And I said, yeah, but uh, you know, if it's being used for something important, that doesn't bother me in the slightest, not in the slightest. I created this so people would use it. And that, that my goal was to make it a smarter planet. And I'm still at that and Lord knows, 
uh, after the last election in the United States, we really need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, you answered the question I had. There, there, there is a, a method they use, I think, with veterans. They call the rewind technique. Rewind. Call it technique. The what? Rewind. Oh, I'm sorry. Rewind. I don't know about that. It, it, it sounds like uh, fast phobia cure stuff. Oh, okay. Well, rewind your memories. Me. They, they, they've been using NLP with veterans uh, since the Vietnam War. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Vietnam War veterans that came back, they, you know, there was actually a study done uh, about using disassociation that I put in the back of Magic in Action just so that it would get more play. I didn't do the study, somebody else did, and they used disassociation. And, uh, but uh, I, I've been working with veterans uh, at, from wars back as far as World War II and the Korean War. I had, as clients in the 70, Korean War people that were still having horrible problems. Uh, and some of their descriptions were so nightmarish, it, 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 it gave me bad dreams just hearing about it. Uh, you know, that, you know, the North Koreans sent, you know, thousands and thousands of people, you know, running at machine gunners who literally mowed them down by the hordes, uh, you know, the, and, and then had to, had to go out and unpile thousands of bodies so that they had a clear sight of firing for the next wave that came across. There's no way in the world that's not going to affect somebody. Uh, you know, when you fire bullets, you know, whatever they hit, the bullet goes in and then something has to go in the opposite direction. For every reaction in physics, there's a opposite. It's in, you know, in, in ballistics, it's called blowback. But you don't shoot, you don't shoot up 50 people with a machine gun without, without, you know, some part of blood and guts and brains and bone and everything flying back in the opposite direction. And it's a terrible thing, but it, it, in order to have a good life, you have to be able to know what in your brain you have to do in order to make it so that you don't just constantly have bad memories and relive bad traumas. Uh, understanding and reliving a bad experience doesn't make it go away, it reinforces it. And yeah. so you have to change the way you think so that you change the way you feel, and therefore it will change what what you're capable of doing in your life, like holding on a job, getting good relationships, all of those things, which I think anybody who's a veteran from any country is entitled to. In this country, we give them home loans, but what we should give them is their lives back. We should make their lives better so that all the skills they learned in the military translate into being functional in the real world. I mean, you know, you take an 18, 20 year old kid and you put him in charge of multi million dollar pieces of equipment, tanks and airplanes and, you know, satellites. And then you release them in, into the real world. And you, what are they going to go do? Work at a hamburger stand? Uh, you know, I'm sorry, but those skills and, you know, their skills of being able to lead a platoon, all of these things are great skills that should translate into good lives. And the only thing that gets in the way is the way they think about them. Otherwise their resumes would take them into great employment and great futures and should, and their ability to build relationships with their comrades in the military should serve as the foundation of coming back and having better relationships with their families, not worse. And very often it comes out the wrong way. So all the work that I've done has been designed in that direction to get people to connect with their life and to manifest, uh, you know, getting in touch with your feelings is fine unless they're terrible feelings, in which case you want better feelings to get in touch with so you can do better things in the world. Great. So, uh, thank you. Uh, I was thinking about one question we had. Uh, what do you think about trans hypnosis and NLP work? Uh, should it be done in trance always, or are there exceptions? Well, uh, if you use the word trance, it's just a general word for all altered states. Being angry is an altered state of consciousness. It's just not as relaxed as what we call hypnosis. And, and to me, I don't think all change should be done in trance because uh, 
you don't want people relaxed when they're doing certain things. You know, uh, there are some things you can relax too much and they don't work out well. You don't want to be terribly relaxed when you're having sex. Otherwise, you wouldn't even get an erection. You want to be excited. So uh, the, to me, the art form of NLP is attaching the right states of consciousness at the right time to the right activity. And, uh, you know, there's a time to be curious and there's a time to be determined and uh, sort of biblical. There's a time for all things and uh, everything in the right place at the right time, things work out. And unfortunately, we're such learning machines that we learn a lot of stuff that just quite frankly is stupid. And it, even if it was appropriate at one time, it, if it's not appropriate at a later time, that the notion that we have to go back and relive trauma, if somebody falls in the river at the age of two, almost drowns, and they come to me later in life, and this actually happened, and uh, they, they couldn't bathe literally. And uh, when the movie Jaws came out, it scared people so bad. There were people in Kansas, 1,500 miles from the ocean, they couldn't swim in a lake or a swimming pool uh, because they would just become so terrified. This is where the learning machine overgeneralizes and you have to know how to interact with our neurology to make it so that it doesn't do that. Uh, because when we learn something, we learn to be terrified or we learn to be addicted or we learn, you know, I've had so many cases of people that were addicted to stupid activities or, or drugs or alcohol or something else. And uh, that, that their first instinct was to do something stupid and they couldn't control, they would say, they would act to me like it was completely out of their control. And the, what they weren't controlling was their thinking. If they changed the way they think, then it wouldn't be a problem. And until the way they change the way they think, they are at the mercy of their thoughts. And when you're at the mercy of your thoughts, you're not gonna be productive. And if you're not productive, then humans are happiest when they, they have. We lost you. Do we have a problem with the uh, internet or is it just me? No, we somehow we lost him. I'm going to ah, call him okay. and see what's up. Okay. Can we think of our camera, maybe? From writing the secrets of happiness with and and to. Okay, we wait and see if we get contact again. Just take us a moment. Okay, great. It was a good cliffhanger. What was it he said just before? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you now. Oh, okay. Um, so I lost the whole screen. After talking about how I didn't lose the internet through all... <laughs> All of the big storms. There's no storms. It's sunny. It's 75 degrees outside. Um, you know, my dogs are laying in the sun with their bellies up. Um, so anyway, I kind of got off on a jag there. What's your, uh, the question was about, do you always use hypnosis? And the answer is no. Uh, sometimes you use hypnosis. And sometimes I use hypnosis to reinforce what I've done to get yeah. people so that you know, people are good at carrying out post-hypnotic suggestions. And a lot of times when you do things that change the way people's thinks, they need to have it reinforced so that they use it. Yeah. It's not enough for them to feel good in a session. What counts is when they get out in the real world and they have to function. Um, my, my job is not, is not to make people feel good during a session. My job is to get them to be more productive when they're in the worst of situations in the real world. Uh, when I work with an alcoholic, I take them bar hopping at the end. Uh, if I have somebody that's afraid of heights, I take them to the tallest building I can find. And when I was in San Francisco, we would, there's a, a building that's the second tallest building in town. 
but it's two towers and in between it is a plexiglass breezeway. And uh, if I got a height phobia, that's where I wanna work with somebody. So I can take them out on that breezeway and have them look down 52 stories. And if, if they're gonna freak out, that would be the moment they would do it. Uh, in, in London, I used to take them to the top of a building. I had uh, uh, a rock and roll musician who was about to do something at a Super Bowl on the top of a 40 foot blow up thing. And he was, he, he was on say phobic, but he was quite nervous about it. And so I just took him up to the top of a building after I was done to make sure that he could function. Paul McKenna did the same thing. He had a, a, a rock musician that you know was gonna be on a big giant tall stage at the Super Bowl. And he took him up to the top of a building and you know made sure that he wasn't gonna be afraid. That's what you have to do. You have to test your work, make sure it works. Um, but you know, getting over phobias does not necessarily require a trance, but it does require an altered state of some kind. You have to alter your state of consciousness so that you don't go back in because fear is a trance. It's a particular trance. It's a particular state of consciousness and you have to get people to do something more intelligent. Yeah, thanks. So uh, everyone here are familiar with NLP if, in one way or another, a lot of uh, are trained in NLP. Uh, you also designed other techniques and methods like uh, DHE and NHR. Can you tell us a little bit about the difference between these and NLP? Well, neuro-linguistic programming was made by me and John Grinder. We were both mathematicians and mathematicians prize something called elegance. And it has nothing to do with swanky clothes. Elegance is, is where you design a system that takes the minimum amount of things to produce the maximum result. So that when we did strategy elicitation, the very first instinct of a mathematician is to streamline the strategy so there's nothing excess in it. And we designed a lot of motivation strategies, learning strategies, the whole nonsense about spelling was to get people to have a, a program in their mind that would achieve the task. Because if you don't have a good strategy to spell, you'll never be a good speller. And in fact, most countries use uh, phonetic spellers and you can't even spell phonetics phonetically. Uh, you know, when, the first time I went to Ireland, when I moved to Ireland, there was a phone booth. Uh, you don't see many of those anymore, but it said on the front of it, F-O-N-E. And I was actually shocked growing up in America, uh, phone is spelled P-H. But if you do that phonetically, that would make it a pahony. Uh, you know, it's like phonetics is really pahonics. And uh, it's just a bad system. Good spellers make pictures of words and the letters are usually very large, you know, eight to 12 inches. And they look at the word and they look down at the little word that's on a piece of paper. They make a big one in their head. They memorize it. They say the word so that when somebody says a word like necessary, they see it in big letters. I, I found people who want spelling tests. Uh, little 12 year old girls that got every word in the dictionary right and asked them how they had memorized them and they look at the word on the paper they make a big one in their head they look away they look back and then they make sure that it's right and uh, and they don't teach that in school and I wanted them to teach it in school so why I wrote an education book that's why I taught for 50 years was to make it so that people had an even chance at least at the beginning of being smart if you teach the brain how to think properly, it's more likely to be able to do math, spelling, reading, arithmetic, uh, memorize history, all of those things that you have to do academically. Children should be taught the foundation. At one time, I even tried to start a school, but the state of Hawaii wouldn't let me uh, because the people that I wanted, I had agreements from all of these geniuses to come out and teach. I had somebody donating a private school that was on private land and uh, they still wouldn't let me do it because people didn't have teaching credentials. You know, uh, Buckminster Fuller was going to teach fifth graders architecture. Uh, you know, I had all kinds of commitments from geniuses so that people in the first six years of life would be exposed to the smartest people. And I was going to teach them to read, write, spell, do math, 
the way smart people do it and then turn them loose. I wanted to create not just you know people who could regurgitate information, but people who had the foundation of creative thinking. And uh, this idea was apparently way too far ahead of its time. Uh, we're having debates in this country about whether people go to school or not. Right now, the teachers unions are fighting saying it's not safe to go to school. And if, if kids are not exposed to the environment where they learn to socialize with other human beings, I'm not a big believer that homeschooling should be done with a single kid, whether it's on a computer or you know, with their parents. I'm a believer that kids have to learn to interact with other people to be able to function in the world well. And uh, that I, I don't think it should necessarily be the public school. I, I think that, you know, it would be good if the government went to the voucher system, for example, in this country, gave everybody a voucher and they could send their kid to any school they wanted to. Private school, Catholic school, religious school, I don't care what kind of school it is. But then the schools would be in competition and they would make an effort to better educate people because the people with the best test scores and the people whose kids you know, were going to college would end up having more people enrolled. Competition is a good thing, it produces quality. And uh, I know Sweden is a fairly socialistic country, but you have a really good education system compared to the United States anyway. Uh, it's ranked very high in education and valuing education and making people smart is a good thing. And I just wanted to give teachers the foundation on which to make kids smarter, quicker, faster. Uh, it's what I do in everything I do. Now, as a mathematician, elegance, like if you think about it in English, I don't know about Swedish because I've never really studied it, but in English, there are 10 off on switches that make every sound in the language. You're either parsing your lips or not. You're either blowing air or not. You're either raising your tongue or not. And with those 10 distinctions, you can create every sound. Therefore, it's a very elegant system. So when we designed NLP for the first 10 years, that's what we were focused on. And uh, when I started working by myself, I started asking the question, well, what's the opposite of NLP? It was just, at first, just a theoretical question. It would be to create inelegant things. Now, being somebody that was a musician, had a recording studio, was very big into things like sound effects and stuff, I started uh, designing strategies that were, by all token, not terribly elegant, but they turned out to be terribly effective. Design human engineering, I, I got a DAT recorder and a holophonic microphone and went down to the local choir at the Black Church and recorded things like, you know, uh, 180 of uh, black people, you know, saying single words. I paid the choir director some money and, you know, and I would say a word and they would repeat it and, and I would record it so that it would be all around you. Now, when you listen with headphones, with it, when you record holophonically, you get distance, height, front, back, all of that stuff. And I started, you know, doing jet engines. I went to the zoo and recorded lions and tigers and all of these things and started putting sound effects in things so that when people thought about being motivated, they heard the sound of a jet engine starting. So in their head, they did, instead of going, well, it's time to go to the store, see yourself going to the store, feel like you're going to the store and going to the store. When you thought about getting something done, it created ferocious desire. And I discovered that, that where NLP tries to figure out how to get something done with the minimum amount, design human engineering says, how much stuff can we use to amplify the state of consciousness so that somebody, instead of desire, we have wanted desire. Instead of motivation, we have ferocious motivation. So that, that, that with my clients, uh, getting there wasn't enough. I wanted them to go there like a rocket ship. And so the difference between the two is one is a perfectly elegant system and the other one is looking for perfection as, a, as an art form in inelegance. Um, then uh, later on, I started realizing that these are profoundly altered states that, that when you create a design human engineering state, that what you're doing is, uh, is accessing the chemical neurological basis of states of consciousness that if your brain is capable of an infinite number of states, that motivation on a scale of one to a thousand 
we're probably accessing somewhere in the neighborhood of five to seven, you know, and, and that would be the best most people ever do that, that I want to know how we get closer to a thousand. So I started using, because hypnosis in my mind is, is about eliciting states and amplifying states. And hypnotic practices allow you to amplify states to make shit that's not terribly important, extremely important. Uh, I remember seeing a stage hypnotist one time take a thimble and, uh, and he told somebody to look at the thimble and to make it the most important object in the world, to literally fall in love with it. And they looked at it and they, 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 you could see on their face, they were shining, they were smiling. They touched it and just went, ooh. And then he took the thimble and he said, you're never gonna see this thimble again. And the person burst out crying and it was all this emotion. Now, stage hypnotists are, are in the business of entertaining people. I'm not in the business of entertaining people. I'm in the business of educating people. So when I saw that, I thought, hmm, you know, if I could make it so that when I got somebody motivated, I could get the neurochemistry to produce this. So especially when I discovered I had years and years and years and years ago, uh, probably back in the late 70s, I had an opera singer as a client and he was having problems because his dose was always was numb and he, it, 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 he couldn't sing properly, he couldn't feel his nose and therefore he couldn't manipulate his sound and everything correctly. And uh, it, when he came to me, it just inadvertently one of those things being a musician, when he said, when he said to me, my nose is always numb, I heard the intonation. And in America, I don't know if they do it in Sweden, they're always looking at little kids and going, got your nose, little Billy Schwartz. And, you know, and, and then doing this and people, oh, well, my nose back. And uh, I heard the intonation. So I just leaned over towards him and I went, here's your nose back. And uh, no trance, no nothing. This is in the first five minutes, he's there. And suddenly he looked at me and he goes, my nose is fine. Now, I don't know what happened in the past. I don't even know if it was accurate. I, it could have, maybe they, somebody took his nose away. Maybe they didn't, I don't know. But suddenly his nose isn't numb anymore. And that's what he paid me an enormous amount of money to fix. And he looked at me and he said, he goes, I've been here six minutes, am I done? And I said, well, let me, let me ask you. I, I said, you know, that can't be the only thing that's bothering you. And he said, well, he said, actually, he said, you know, when I'm performing, he said, I am absolutely the most motivated singer on the planet. But when I'm rehearsing, he said, I, I just can't get myself to sit in a room. I've got the notes on the page. I know the opera by heart. He said, but I can't really get into it. And I said to him, I said, well, let me ask you this. When you're on stage and performing, where do your feelings start? And he went down here at the diaphragm and he said, and everything just pours out and out. And I said, and when you're rehearsing, he goes, ah, it's just not the same. And a light bulb went off in my head. I've seen this gesture a thousand times. And so I asked him, I said, okay, you know, take the feelings that you have when you're performing, he said. When I asked him, I said, do you have a piece of music? And he opened his briefcase and pulled out this complicated thing. I'm a musician. I don't read music very well. And there's no way in my life I could have ever read this. It was just too complicated. And, uh, you know, and I said, uh, keep the feelings spinning this way. Spin them faster. Spin them faster and start rehearsing. And he stood up and he looked at the music and he started rehearsing. And uh, that's where the big thing about spinning feelings started. And uh, when I discovered that, you know, you could spin feelings, then I went and talked to a neurologist that I knew. I said, you know, what the heck is going on here? And he started explaining to me that we have different sets of neurosynapses and that the more it repeats, he said, that's why anxiety attacks build. He said, it's all based on the way our neurology works. And uh, that, the, you know, the, the more we do something, it builds up to a certain point. And he said, and either it climaxes and ends or it recedes back the way it is. And as it turns out, when people have strong feelings, 
those strong feelings build up in their body, they spread out to they become a whole body sensation. And it either goes out through their fingers, it climaxes, so to speak, or it just slowly reverses back to where it started. And whether people have good feelings or bad feelings, it all works the same way. Understanding that in NHR, what we do is, is we go in and bathe people, literally neurologically, in the neurochemistry of a state of consciousness. We induce a powerful altered state. We induce the state we want. We amplify the state we want. And then we attach it to where it would be useful. Uh, the greatest example of this, you probably see me do this on stage. I'll bring somebody up and I get them to start laughing to the point where they can't stop. Contagious laughter. And uh, sometimes when I start doing it, the whole audience will be laughing. I've had a thousand people in front of me. And every time the person would start to laugh, everybody in the audience laughs. And then they try to catch their breath. They go, oh, oh, <laughs> and they start laughing again. Now, I take that state of consciousness and that when they're in the height of it, I ask them things. I go, what are you too serious about? You know, and, and as I start to go through the things they're too serious about, they're so bathed in this state of consciousness, full of endorphins, full of oxytocin, all the neurochemicals uh, that surround those states of consciousness, that even after I bring them out of trance, or the laughing trance, and I sit them down and I go, okay, now think about this again. And it won't bother them anymore. They're not, they can't be serious about it. They start laughing because the state of consciousness becomes attached to the images and the voices in their head. Fascinating. Great. Thank you. I have a question. When, when we did the trainer training a few years ago in uh, Just Orlando. One second. Yeah. I, I, my, my, uh, antivirus stuff came up and it's, oh. uh, I'm afraid it's going to shut us off. It's trying to break in my Mac. I just want to make it go away, go away, ignore. Go okay. away virus. Great. Yeah, you did, uh, because usually when, when you are in a trance or in hypnosis, usually time, the time seems shorter than, than it actually was. It can, it could go either way. Yeah, that's what I was uh, wanted to ask you, uh, because you did, did that with us uh, at the training training. Well, my belief is that, uh, that, see, when I do the trainer's training, I have a very specific set of goals, because the last thing, it, they're going to be teaching my material, and some of them come because they're going to make presentations about real estate, or they're going to make presentations, or they teach English in college but they, they come to the trainer's training to become more charismatic. In order to do that, I have a couple of goals. You have to be able to, to stop thinking about things because you should know what you're teaching. You shouldn't have to figure it out while you're on the stage. You should be able to talk extemporaneously. You should hear the sound of your voice and you should see the effect it has on an audience. In order to create that state of consciousness, I have to be able to get people into the state of listening to themselves talk so that instead of thinking and then talking, they're talking and hearing what they're saying and knowing where to go. And this requires that you get an audience to be roughly in the same state, not exactly in the same state, but you have to get them to anticipate uh, that all, all learning, all movement, all physical activity, a big part of it is anticipating. It just, when I think about, you know, there's something too small for me to see on the screen here, I look down at my glasses because I start out anticipate seeing it. And my brain tells me I'm going to need my glasses. When my hand reaches for the glasses, it starts out moving slower. The closer it gets to the glasses, the faster it gets. And when it picks them up, it starts out slowly and the faster they get, the last movement will be the quickest. And I have to get people to anticipate getting people so that they watch everybody in the audience close enough that if everybody, anybody moves, they just look at them. Eventually you can get to the point where an audience is relatively breathing at the same rate and responding at roughly the same rate. In order to do that, I have to heighten your state of awareness. 
So part of what I'm going to do is create the right states inside of you to do that. And ultimately, I put people into a trance and teach them to do time distortion on purpose so that in my world, the world is moving slower than everybody else. So that while other people feel like they're moving fast, they look like they're moving slow to me. And when I'm talking, I can hear my voice and every tone and texture and inflection of my voice so that I can be more precise with it. This, the, the, the goal I have for people in the trainer's training is to become really precise communicators so they can make an audience relax, they can make them excited, they can get them to anticipate, they can get them to hesitate and get that hesitation to lead to enough frustration that they become impatient so that they really desire to learn something new. That when I was teaching originally, I would get all of these psychotherapists that had read The Structure of Magic or the book about Milton Erickson and they would come in and they would look at me. I was usually half their age and I was talking about, I was talking about science and most of them became psychotherapists because they weren't good at science and you know they didn't like that kind of stuff and uh, that were not the kind of books that they read. I had to get them to believe that this would help because they all wanted to help their clients. They had a million reasons why they couldn't. They weren't ready yet. Uh, you know, that, you know, they're, you know, they're unconscious that you had to peel away layers of their personality to find their real self, that you had to go back, that, that change was a slow, tedious five-year process. And I would bring somebody on the stage with a terrible phobia and, and, and moments later, they wouldn't have it. And it was such a convincing phenomenon that I could capture their attention. I still had to teach them to be able to see enough, hear enough, and believe enough in people to try and do change so that, that, that the clients, because I was trying to fix clients through the people in the audience. What I wasn't really worried about the people in the audience. I was worried about all the patients that were coming to them. And, you know, in those days, psychiatrists were giving out massive amounts of tranquilizers, which really don't help people to be more intelligent any more than alcohol helps people to be. It may have reduced their anxiety, but it didn't convert it into productive energy. And to me, that, that when you go to the trainer's training, I'm trying to teach people to be a precise communicator. This requires that you control your state of consciousness and learn to slow time down or to speed it up as the need determines. Great, thank you. Uh, There's a good what, video that I made about time distortion. Um, that, you know, that there's now a site you can join uh, that uh, uh, John Lavelle's son has, uh, NLP Eternal, where you can get a lot of these DVDs and videos and stuff, you know, dating back to the 70s up to the present. You know. Yeah, great. So uh, what are your thoughts about the future of NLP? It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not done yet. No, of course. Means. I remember back in the 1980s, somebody saying to me, well, NLP is a completely formed thing and we know everything we need to know. Yeah. And thinking to myself, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. To think that, you know, because you can fix a few clients that we've got it done, you know, that's the point at which the clients that you can't help, you start telling them there's something wrong with them, which is what psychiatry did and psychotherapy did that, you know, salespeople do it. Well, he didn't really want to buy anything. He just came in a furniture store, you know, lost his way, walked into a furniture store, walked around and looked at furniture, but he didn't really want to buy anything, you know. This, when, when you give your power away to somebody else in a negotiation, in a business, when you go to an employee and you talk to them and they don't do what you tell them to, if you blame the employee, you take away your own power. If, if you say, I can adjust myself and get this done, then you start learning new things. Part of the reason I made it a policy to take the clients that have been given up on, all the psychiatrists that I knew at the time, I would go, who's your worst client? Who's the one you think nobody's ever going to be able to help? The reason I took those is because I learned the most.
because I number one knew that 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 everything that was in their file was something I shouldn't try. And whether they had been had electric shock treatment, been through vitamin therapy. I mean, the list went on. Uh, you know, the group psychotherapy, Gestalt therapy, TA therapy, all the crap they'd been through. And you know, some of them have been in therapy for 15 years and made no headway, and many times had gotten worse. So that file told me, don't do this stuff. That's all it said to me. I would read through it and go, no, nope, don't try that. Don't try this. Don't try that. Don't try this. So very often I had to make something up. So I, I, I developed, this, you know, the meta model is a very specific tool. Uh, uh, oddly enough, you know, 50 years later, the structure of magic, the publishing company is gone. The book is out of print. And uh, I was going to re-release it. And when I started looking at it, I went, it's not a book about language and therapy. It's a book about problem solving. So I've rewritten the book. It will be released in the next year or so uh, when we get it done. It's being re-released as a book about problem solving because that's what it is. So when I didn't know what to do, I, I relied upon the meta model to ask just the right questions in just the right way so that the client would tell me what to do. Uh, and if that didn't work, I'd use a, Milton, a technique that Milton used, which I thought was brilliant. Milton had a client come in one time, he put them into deep trance, pseudo oriented them in time to the future, where it was now a year later, the client was had a perfectly happy, normal life and came back to visit Milton. And when Milton said, when I wake you up, I, I, you refresh my memory about exactly what I did that helped you to have such a good life. And I started doing that with clients and they came up with wild ass shit, you know, and they would tell me, oh, you did this and then you did this and then you put me in a trance and you said this and you did this and I'd go, great. I put them back into trance and do exactly what they said. And I'd say probably 70% of the time it would work, even if it sounded like nonsense to me. You know, I mean, one of them told me, you know, oh, you, you know, you got mustard out of the kitchen and you put mustard on my forehead. And I, I remember sitting there thinking mustard on the forehead. That doesn't sound like an NLP <laughs> technique. And, and so I went in there and I got some mustard and I went and brought them out of trance. I said, OK, this is going to seem a little odd, but trust me, I believe this will work with you. And I put mustard on his forehead. And sure enough, his, his hallucinations went away, his delusions went away, and massive migraines disappeared. I have no explanation for that, uh, none whatsoever. But, uh, you know, I, I figured it was worth a try because nobody else knew what to do. But many of the techniques that I use, especially with submodalities and swish patterns and all of these things, came from asking precise enough questions and listening to their answers when you know when I, I said you know I said how, how do you know when to have this bother you and people go well I got this thing just blown out of proportion and I go uh-huh so they got a really big that night go is it life size or larger than life and they go almost four times larger than life size and they go my head in it is this big <laughs> and I go oh, okay well let's try shrinking that down and, uh, you know, and they shrink it down and it would go back to being big. So I go, well, let's try shrinking it down really quickly. Or let's try putting a border around it and shrinking it down. And, and then I put a button in the picture that would freeze it. And, you know, all of these things which we now think of as common techniques, the things in Get the Life You Want and all those other books. You know, I've got 33 books out now and uh, <clears throat> a couple more on the way. Um, the, the reason I've been productive is because my clients have provided me a plethora of opportunities to try new things. And when your policy is what doesn't work should be ignored, and then you keep, and it, you know, if something doesn't work, doing it more often isn't gonna make it work. Einstein's definition of insanity was doing the same thing and expecting a different result. The universe just isn't that way. And, you know, you can ask people how they feel about that over and over and over again. And most of the time they will give you a different answer each time. 
you know, how do you feel about that? Well, I feel okay. How do you feel about feeling okay? Well, I'm a little depressed about that. How do you feel about being depressed? Well, I'm okay with that. Uh, you know, that's, that's these endless things. It's like why questions. There, there used to be a computer program and no matter what you answered, it would ask you why. And it was supposed to be a psychiatrist, you know, your computerized psychiatrist. This is back when computers were in four story buildings. And I remember seeing it on an IBM back once and, you know, they goes, I'm feeling depressed and it would go, why are you depressed? And it go, because nobody loves me. Why does, why does nobody love you? Because I'm depressed. You know, they all end up as big giant tautologies of logic. And it's not logic that makes people think. Albert Ellis used to try to talk people out of being insane and it never worked really very well. And uh, it, that you can't talk people out of anxiety, you have to teach them to relax. And so, you know, Virginia Satir said the smartest thing to me and it stuck with me my entire career. She, I asked her one time, I said, I, I said, I said, Virginia, I said, how do people get so crazy? Because some of the clients I watched her work with were really loopy. And uh, she said to me, she said, well, she said, people will make the best choice if they have one. If they don't have one, they'll just keep making the same choice. And she said, you have to give people new choices so that they can choose. And they will typically choose the best choice. And uh, I've kept that as a policy through the years that my job is to provide people so that instead of the neurosynapse being and, 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 it's or. And when you build the or gates and the neurosynapses, then people have new choices. Uh, later in life, I discovered that sometimes I'd rather make the choice than them because the or gate leads to bad behaviors. So sometimes I shut a gate off and open five new ones, uh, maybe a better choice. But then uh, I, I'm, I'm not a permissive therapist by any means. That's just not my job. I'm a neuro-linguistic programmer. I want the programs to function to create good things. If the program is to teach you to spell, I want it so that you get the words accurate. If you're going to have a build a motivation strategy, I want to make sure that it turns on and turns off so that you don't keep doing things when you don't need to. A lot of highly motivated businessmen come home and they open the door and they can't stop thinking about what they did all day. That's, and then they wonder why their personal relationships are screwed up or why they're drinking in order to relax or taking tranquilizers. I can't tell you how many tranquilizers. A lot of the psychiatrists have brought me clients. I would have them bring the medication in and it, 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 it was shocking how many people were on Valium in those days, you know? And I love the FDA's solution to that in America when they discovered there were, there were more prescriptions for Valium than there were people that, you know, that people were abusing it wildly and going multiple psychiatrists and getting prescriptions. They changed the name of it to diazepam. <laughs> that, that was how they dealt with it. They go, well, people are taking too much of this drug, so we're going to change the name of it. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, that doesn't solve the problem. Problem is, instead of the neural synapses telling you, I'm feeling anxiety, take this pill, it should tell you, take a few deep breaths and relax and think of something you would rather do than sit around and be anxious so that you're planning. Most of the hours of bad feelings that people have throughout the course of a day are all the brain planning. The fact that people tell you, I'm gonna, you know, cause I'll ask them how many, how many minutes in the course of a day do you spend thinking about this bad memory, thinking, worrying about your husband cheating on you or whatever the hell's bothering them. And uh, it, it, you know, it's two minutes here, three minutes there. It adds up 30 minutes a day, an hour a day, good Lord, that's a lot of time, an hour a day. 30 minutes a day is roughly 1,500 hours in a year, you know, 15,000 in 10 years and 60,000 in 40 years. And, you know, and I'll look at my clients and go, does that sound like a good plan? And they'll always say to me, they go, well, I'm not planning it. And I go, you're predicting for me that you're gonna do it. That's called planning, right? You need a better plan. And until people can think of something they desire more than their bad feelings, desire has to be stronger than whatever's bothering them. And if you can get them to desire to do other things, to see themselves, 
uh, you know, the big secret to getting people to quit smoking is to see themselves being a non-smoker, walking through a room full of people smoking cigarettes and not wanting one, and people offering them cigarettes after sex, after meals, and just not being interested. And I ask them, I go, would you want to be that person? And they always go, oh, yes. And I go, uh -huh. not enough. If I can turn that feeling up and make it incredibly intense so that it's stronger than a desire for a cigarette, they'll never smoke again. I've done it thousands of times. And, uh, you know, and, it, and, and you have to prepare them. They're going to go through withdrawal. But when they start to go through withdrawal, their brain has to identify it. Oh, my God, I'm feeling anxious. I want a cigarette. And go, oh, man, I'm going through withdrawal. I'm doing exactly the right thing. I do this with hard drugs, with heroin, with methadone, which is the most addictive substance I think you have to work with. That and oxycotene are the two most addictive things on the planet, fentanyl, stuff like that. Uh, very addictive, very intense withdrawal symptoms from these things. You know, I mean, to the point sometimes where people literally hallucinate. Uh, methadone, I one guy was hallucinating this little girl following him around going, I know what you did. <laughs> it's like a Fellini movie. But, you know, his brain has to go, I'm going through withdrawal. I'm doing exactly the right thing. And boom, you get an endorphin rush, which is exactly what you get from the drugs. Endomorphemes. Fantastic. So do you have any more tips? Uh, what anyone can do daily or uh, to just have a better life? Because that's... Well, one of the main things people, if they want to have a better life, is, is to realize that at the times where you start to feel hopeless or helpless, uh, as one of, one of, I have a really smart student up in Canada, this young kid who really got into NLP because he studies so much about neurology. He literally sends me 50 to 100 articles once a month you know, of all this neurological stuff. And of course, when they do neurological stuff, they don't realize the implications of it. They're just studying how it works and, and you know, having journal article arguments, which are the slowest conversations on the planet. I write something, six months later, you respond to it. Six months later, I respond to what you said. Journal articles are the slowest communication on the planet. Uh, and, but all the stuff that's in the article, sometimes there are things where they, there's a lovely thing in, in scientific research where the, anything that just really doesn't fit or is quirky, they, they set aside and they go, well, this weird thing happened. We, while we were doing it, while I was proving my point, this odd thing kept happening. And those are the parts I really like. This is literally how accessing cues was discovered. A woman named Dorothy Kimura wrote this journal article where they were studying the vibration of eyes and uh, it, and it, and your eyes jiggle all the time so that the nerves don't habituate. So they attach cameras to the eyes. And of course, after a few seconds, the object on the thing disappeared. And when she asked people, what, what, the, what was the object? Uh, something like 77% or something stopped and looked up and to the left and then answered. And she said, this must mean something. And when I read it, I went in and started asking people, what are the first four notes of Beethoven's symphony? What color are your mother's eyes? Can you see a giraffe with a rhinoceros's head? All the variations of possible things. And oddly enough, people's accessing cues were relatively the same, except for the people that had the watch on this arm. <laughs> Those yeah. left-handed people. And, and when the pattern fell out, and I started teaching it to people who were psychotherapists. They were amazed. But anyway, this, this kid who sends me all of these lovely articles and things about this, this is what the new generation of NLP people are going to be like. They're going to be educated. I mean, there's, there's room for everybody in NLP. You know, There are salespeople that use it. Uh, it's used by intelligence organizations. Uh, you know, I, I, I used to work with an agency that shall remain unnamed training, you know, so that they could flip double agents over and uh, so that they could extract information and interrogation and things like this, you know, to avoid terrorist attacks. And, you know, uh, because spying is a business that's dangerous by all means. 
And to me, you know, when, when, when we all protect our militaries, whatever country it is, there are militaries that are opposed to us, but I still think the people in the countries should support the military unless the military is, is, is using them as the object. Any country that has the guns pointing in is doing the wrong thing, as I always say. You know, it's one of the things that I was amazed about the Berlin Wall when it still was there and I looked at it was, you know, our guys had our guns pointing at them and they had their guns pointing at their own citizens, uh, you know, that, you know, because there were a lot of people in East Berlin trying to get out. And uh, I believe a lot of what the Berlin Wall coming down had to do with was the fact that, that there was a point in time where people were getting televisions and radios and uh, and they literally cut a hole in the Berlin Wall and let 100,000 people come over and gave them 100 Dutch marks to learn to shop. And that was it. Then the wall suddenly came down. People came back with Nikes and jeans and all this good stuff. And, uh, you know, and that suddenly the, the soldiers were wanted to be the next ones in line. They didn't want to shoot anybody for going to the West. They wanted to go too. And, you know, that... Uh, that as, as the population of the world increases and the amount of wealth increases in the planet, uh, that you know, I, I am a, a great believer that optimistically, most of, of the really things that create wars will disappear. I think having the largest McDonald's in the world in the middle of Moscow means we probably will never bomb it. Uh, yeah. and, and you know, I, I think that as much as I'm not a big fan of globalization, uh, I, I think, you know, the more that people come in and, and into each other and visit each other's countries, you know, I've been all over the planet and I seem to get along with pretty much everybody. The odd thing about NLP is that people come from countries, you know, from Israel and Jordan and Saudi Arabia and England and, and Russia and Moscow and Sweden and, and South America, and they all get together, have a good time and get along, you know, and, uh, it, you know, there are countries like Bahrain where, where Jews and Arabs and Christians all get along just fine. Yeah. And uh, my hope is, is the smarter people get, the more they'll just get along and figure out how we can all do better, faster, quicker, better. Great. Uh, I, I was uh, right now, when you were speaking about uh, access and cues, uh, I had this idea or theory and i don't know your take on it uh, i haven't heard it before i access in cues uh do you think that is what happens during rem sleep when you dream no no <laughs> okay <laughs> i don't think it i'm very sure of it uh, can you tell me why uh, uh well i because one one is about accessing information yeah and it's very specific that the rim movement uh, are exaggerated eye movements that are a reflection of dreaming, which is a different process. Unlike Freud, I don't think your dreams have anything to do with wish fulfillment. I think it has to do with encoding of information. And that, you know, the more you learn, the more you dream. Uh, children are dreaming wildly because they're growing millions and billions of neural pathways. As you get older, you're still building neural pathways, so you just don't have as much REM sleep. But neurologists are pretty sure about this. And the, the rim movement of the eyes has, is a reflection of what goes on as the brain cleans itself and, and grows new cortical pathways. It's also the same time by which you get rid of bad chemicals in the brain and put in oxygen and nutrients. The brain consumes most of the energy of the human body. It's, it's an incredible organism, but I, I, I don't think it's accessing. It's not that your eyes are jumping from feeling and thinking and visualizing. When, when, when you ask somebody a question, like what color are your mother's eyes? They have to go and get the information. Yeah. And given that the brain is very holographic in its function, uh, that, that it, it, it's just like a computer. You know, it, you know, you can input all the information in the world, but if you don't have some way of getting it back out, you never will. Um, I know that from my own filing systems. You know, when I got a, a computer, I, you know, I used to name the files, and there was a point at which there was too many things with too similar of names, 
and it became very hard to find things. Uh, you know that you know that that if you, if you gave every file the same name, it would be hard to find. Yeah. So you have to have somewhere to start. So you either start with a feeling, you start with a some part of a picture, and you, you know, and you have to think about your mother's face, and then you have to focus on the eyes. And the more complicated the question, you know, the more people will use accessing cues. A lot of times when you ask people to, for information, the information isn't very far, so you can barely see it. They'll just be focused slightly. And that's because it's not a complicated question. And uh, the more complicated the question, if you ask somebody what, you know, what their toes feel like when they slip into a warm bath and their toes come up, they have to rebuild that, that, that memory in order to go in it and access the information. So it's going to be more detailed. And uh, that when you dream, there's a reflection of what the dream is. The dream doesn't necessarily content wise have anything to do with what you're encoding. You know, I mean, okay. sometimes it does. I, I, I worked stapling books in college. Uh, you know, you get a book and put it in cardboard and staple the cardboard and slam a mailing label in it. It was in a shipping warehouse. And the first day I was there, I used the staple machine for eight hours. I went home and fell asleep and did it for another eight hours. Right. But most of the time, the dream isn't that directly related to the activity. And that as you learn things, generalize things, that, you know, that it's, it's a reflection of the waves. When you, when you throw five pebbles into a pond, the waves ripple and they create a pattern. And as long as the pattern is there, it will be reflected in whatever the dream is about. Just because you dreamt about flying doesn't mean you fly, flew all day. Um, you know, okay. that sort of thing. Great, thanks. Uh, people are curious here to hear one or more about, you know, the stories from the 70s uh the stories from yeah the <laughs> like the uh, when john and i when john grinder and i were very wild because yeah. we didn't have the technology that we have now yeah so we had to do crazy ass things these uh, things right yeah i mean i performed an exorcism on the helicopter pad at dominican hospital uh there was a, this psychiatrist that asked me to come and see this guy who thought he was possessed by the devil. Uh, there was a lot more of that, you know, when the exorcist came out, you know, like when Jaws came out, everybody was afraid of water. Um, they actually bankrupt the largest diving company in the world. Uh, they were doing uh, close to 300 million a year and selling diving equipment. And then the year after Jaws came out, I think they only did 300 gross in sales. Um, it was just terrible, they went bankrupt. And they had helped to make the movie. This was the, the odd punchline of that story. But yeah, uh, one time uh, we got a bunch of people and we set up a cross out on the helicopter pad at Dominican. I got, I went to a goth store, you know, kind of gothic, you know, stuff, yeah. you know, the leather vests and all that and bought this flask that had demonic pictures all over it, you know, uh, you know, there were, gargoyles and stuff on the flask and and i put perrier in it so because i figured that holy water should fizz I, all the real holy water was always disappointing to me but uh you know shook it up on i brought this guy out and i you know uh, i dressed kind of as a catholic uh, priest and he came out and dragged him out tied him to this cross i had people chanting in latin uh luckily he didn't speak latin so he didn't know what they were chanting because, you know, I think it was Rockabye Baby or something like that. You know, they didn't know what they were chanting either. We had just rehearsed it. And uh, while they were chanting, all holding candles in a semi solder I went over and then took the flask and held it up where he could see it and said, you know, be gone and threw fizzy water on his forehead. And I guess he could feel it. I, I, I put a little uh, cayenne pepper in it, too, just to give it a kick. And... Uh, you know, he felt a little burning on him and, uh, you know, screamed wildly, did it three times and the demon left. Uh, <laughs> and, Fantastic. Uh, well, it was funny because when we brought him back into the, the hospital and the psychiatrist, the psychiatrist was more affected by it than the patient. 
I, I, I thought I was going to have to take him out and, uh, and do an exorcism on him too. He kept looking at me and he goes, I can't believe you just did this. Because he didn't know he was in the hospital. I had everything all set up outside and went in and we dragged this guy out and kicking and screaming the whole time saying, you know, I'm not having shit like this. <clears throat> yeah. And after seeing the exorcist, I knew exactly what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I consider that an educational film. <laughs> yeah. Still one of the funniest movies I've ever seen in my life. I went to see it with a bunch of people who were fairly religious and good God, it scared the crap out of them. But I couldn't stop laughing in that movie. And I was the only one in the theater laughing. Uh, it, I just, that line out of that movie where he goes, nice day for an exorcism. Don't you think? I just thought that was one of the funniest things I'd ever heard. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we did some crazy ass stuff, but uh, you, you had to because, you know, psychiatry had become so fixed and so inflexible and, you know, that it, it, basically a patient walked into a psychiatrist's office and the psychiatrist either listened to them babble for an hour and went, mm -hmm. oh, tell me about your mother, uh, you know, like. You know, they, they, they were so programmed to believe that people didn't change quickly, that they didn't do anything intense. In fact, the reason the psychiatrist sat at the end of the couch outside the patient's view was so that they didn't influence them. And believe me, it worked. Uh, you know, that's why they had patients for as long as they did. Yeah. And it wasn't that psychiatrists didn't want to help people. It's that they just weren't trained to influence people. Most of them didn't do any hypnosis. Psychotherapists were so brainwashed, and I mean it literally brainwashed, to, that all you had to do is say that I do hypnosis and their pupils would dilate. They would look at you and go, oh, hypnosis is bad and it doesn't exist. There's really no such thing as hypnosis. And I would go, aren't those contradictory? How can it be bad if it doesn't exist? You know, first time I heard people talking about it and I heard that, I went, ooh, I got to learn this. I went out and bought 150 books on hypnosis, mostly published in the 18 and 1900s. Uh, and, you know, that back when they had darts coming out of their eyes on the covers and stuff and read all of the techniques and started trying them. And it turned out it was not terribly difficult to put people in trance and glue their hands together and glue them to the floor and, and age regress them back to the age of five and all of these things. And I recognized very quickly that most of the techniques of psychotherapy, psychodrama, uh, gestalt therapy, all of this stuff were hypnotic techniques. You know, I'm sorry, you don't look at an empty chair and talk to a dead relative if you're not in a trance. <laughs> <laughs> especially when they talk back. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, the, one of the other things that really educated me was uh, we went to uh, Napa State Mental Hospital and uh, we were, Virginia brought me up there and she was going to do a presentation, a seminar. And the director of training just assumed since I was with her, I must be somebody important. And I was actually still an undergraduate in college and just trying to figure shit out. I just knew Virginia and she didn't drive very well. So she asked me to drive her up there. And when I got there, the guy says, would you like a tour of the hospital? And I went, sure. And uh, as he was walking along, he goes, what would you like to see? And I said, I'd, I'd like to see some of the craziest schizophrenics you got. And uh, he said, well, we don't refer to them as crazy. That's, you know, that's just not the way we talk about them. And I said, okay what you got and he took me into a ward where there was one guy popping up from behind the couch and another guy that kept walking up and kicking me in the back of the heel and they were all men in their 30s or 40s and uh, it looked like they'd been there a while because their zippers were missing off of everything and the buttons because that happens in industrial laundries and uh this one guy just says to me, I wasn't even five feet in the door, says to me, he goes, did you just see me eat a dead baby on a hot dog? And I said to him, I said, no, but I wasn't really watching. 
And the psychiatrist turns to me and goes, don't encourage him. And I thought, wow, you wouldn't want to encourage somebody. That would be a bad thing. <laughs> so I looked back at him and I said, I said, okay. I said, where, where, where did the hot dog and the baby come from? And he looked at me and he goes, I don't know. I said, my question is simpler than the one you're asking. I said, did it come up out of the floor, down from the ceiling, from that wall, this wall, that wall, or this wall? And the psychiatrist said to me, he goes, there is no dead baby and there is no hot dog. And I went, you're going to have to be quiet. And I grabbed a hold of him as only a martial artist can in a way where he lost the desire to speak. Um, there's a little nerve underneath the arm. And when I pressed it, it, it induces wanton pain. And uh, while he was wincing, I went back and I said to the, the schizophrenic, I said, which, where does it come from? And he pointed over to the wall. And when he pointed to one of the walls, all of the other schizophrenics looked at the wall. The psychiatrist looked at the wall. And I said, okay, tell me when it comes out. And when it does, do this. And I said, hold up your finger like this. Go like this. And he did it to himself. I said, not to you, to me. And I said, you know, like that. And I said, I said, can you feel me? And they said, yeah. I said, that's because I'm here. I said, now when the dead baby and the hot dog come by, tap your finger and tell me what happens. And suddenly he starts looking like this across the room and everybody else starts looking across the room and he goes like this and he goes, my hand went right through it. And I said, oh, I said, that's just a visualization. Nothing to worry about. I said, a lot of people do that. And the psychiatrist goes, no, they don't. And I squeezed harder and I looked at him and I said, I said, can you, can you see your mother? And he goes, yeah. I said, if you put your finger through the picture, does it go through or can you feel her? And he goes, well, of course it would go through. And I said, great. See, the psychiatrist does the same thing you do. I said, what you need to do is to stop the when the hot dog gets across, you go like that. Anything you put your finger through isn't really there. So therefore you shouldn't talk to a psychiatrist about it. <laughs> Otherwise you're gonna be here for the rest of your life. Yeah. So if you don't talk about it, you're fine. <laughs> well, excuse me, being a dead baby and a hot dog, if you don't talk about it to anybody, won't get you locked up. Oh, you know, we all imagine crazy ass shit. We think about what we want for dinner. We see a whole plate of fucking food. We don't, we don't, we don't try to eat it. We just see what we want and we order it from the waiter. You know, I don't think it was that he wanted to eat dead babies on hot dogs. He just couldn't stop himself from doing it. I didn't have the technology at the time to tell them how to turn the pictures off. I do now. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, those films they made of me walking with, working with Andy, the schizophrenic, he was one of my favorite schizophrenics. He was really cute. Yeah. Um, you know, he was the one where people came off the TV and, and talked to him and harassed him and yelled at him. And he just had no way to fight back. And, uh, you know, they said he was crazy. They wouldn't even let me have a TV in the room when I saw him. Uh, and they videotaped it. They were looking at the videotape, but they wouldn't let him look at a video. They said, oh, people will come off and follow him around. And of course, he had terrible bad taste. He was watching Little House on the Prairie, for God's sake. You know, that was a horrible TV show. No wonder, you know, <laughs> no wonder he was ended up in a mental hospital. You watch bad television too much. It's not good for you. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have lots of agoraphobics coming out of this year and symptomatic behavior from being locked up too much you know people are going to become germaphobes and you know you can't build up a good immune system if you don't expose your immune system to things that's what an inoculation is for i mean i was immune to you know i had COVID and i was out for three days and it i have to admit it did screw up my lungs a little bit but i would have rather had it early like i did because then i could go out and i didn't have to worry you know, I still went in the supermarket. I only wore a mask to make people feel better. I couldn't give it to them and I couldn't get it from them. Um, I, when I went into my gym over here, I sat down on the couch. Uh, this woman came in and sat down and she went, oh, I forgot to put my mask on. And I said, you don't have to. I've already had COVID. I'm immune. I'm, I'm, I'm just raging with antibodies. I said, even if you have it, you can't give it to me. And she looked at me and she goes, well, I've already had it too. And I said, then we can look at each other and do what's been missing for this entire year. See somebody smile. Uh, I think that's what people need more of. They need to see us smile. <laughs> Keith, 
Uh, we got the, the, the grumpy year. It's just yeah. a grumpy year. All the teenagers are grumpy. Uh, my, my poor son, grandson is in college. I mean, he got, he got a four-year scholarship to a college, which is great because that means I don't have to pay for it. And uh, he gets to college and he can't leave his damn dorm. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, yeah. we go to college and, and watch college on television. That's ridiculous. You know? Yeah. We got a question in the chat here. Uh, here. Uh, uh, when you were talking about uh, uh, the guy with the uh, babies and hot dogs, uh, you, you said uh, you didn't have the technique to turn uh, the pictures off back then. And people wonder, you do now, so how do you do it? Well, it, it depends upon the, the particular schizophrenic and what they're hallucinating. Uh, with Andy, I, you know, he, I was fortunate. He'd seen the Bugs Bunny cartoon where the artist uh, erases Bugs' legs and Bugs starts to complain and he erases Bugs' mouth. So I had him hallucinate, because he's good at hallucinating. I had him hallucinate a television, see the cartoon on it and take the pencil out and start erasing Mary and all the other people that were following him around. Uh, basically, I gave him an off button. Uh, when you're hallucinating, uh, it's always good to have uh, an off button. A lot of people hallucinate things, you know, uh, all the time and don't realize they're hallucinating them. People do negative hallucination as well. Everybody loses their car keys and goes back and they're in the first place they looked because they hallucinated the tabletop on top of the keys. Uh, we're all capable of doing positive and negative hallucination. The question is, can we control it or not? And, you know, an interior decorator hallucinates for a living. Uh, so does a civil engineer. They go out and see roads where they aren't and then measure them. <laughs> uh, hallucinating is not necessarily a bad thing. It just needs to be a skill. And teaching people to control their hallucinations as opposed to to try to talk of them out of them or drug them out of them or worse, electric shock treat them out of them, uh, which is you know not so prevalent these days, but was incredibly prevalent 50 years ago. Yeah. That I had people that came in to me for hypnosis because they had horrible tremors on their face. And when I would say, when did this start? And they'd go, well, I had three series of 16 electric shock treatments to help me with my depression. And I'd go, is your depression better? And they'd go, no, it's actually a lot worse now, but uh, especially because I can't go out without freaking people out because I have all these spasms in my face. I had one woman who was waking up, actually not waking up, she would go to sleep and then she would wake up in the Pacific Ocean. And she lived about 45 minutes by car from the Pacific Ocean. And the psychiatrist that brought her in uh, said, you know, uh, he said, you know, she's been in and out of mental hospitals for years. And I went, oh, God, you know, because now I don't know if this new symptom is a byproduct of having been in there. And I asked her, I said, what happens when you're going to sleep? What are you thinking about? Thinking that, you know, I said, are you thinking, gee, you know, in the middle of the night, I'm going to go into the ocean, and throw myself because they kept saying she was suicidal, but she was throwing herself in two feet of water. Uh, that doesn't sound horribly suicidal to me. Drive all the way over to the ocean. You don't jump off a cliff. You know, you walk out onto the beach and throw yourself in two feet of water. That just didn't sound suicidal to me. I said, I even told her, I said, if you're suicidal, you're horrible at it. You know, I, I can give you suggestions. And she goes, well, I don't feel like I want to kill myself. And I said, what do you think about as you're going to sleep? And she said, well, I see these blasts of blue light between my ears. And I said to her, I said, have you ever had electric shock treatment? And she said, oh yeah, I had five series, you know, and a series is usually 12 to 16 electric shock treatments. They don't just zap you once, you know, they, they, they want to be thorough about it. Because, you know, I don't know how this started. There were some psychiatrist that was a little depressed and was in his workshop and the, the back and stuck his finger in the wall socket and, <clears throat> and suddenly felt better. I, I really don't know how it began, but it's, it's always been something that I found objectionable. You know, when you take away somebody's freedom because they're crazy, you know, and that's to protect them from themselves and from other people. 
But when you start torturing them, which is what they used to do in the old days, is hose you with ice water. And they called all mental illness was called melancholia. You know, and that was back in the dark ages. And they did horrible things to people. Even King George was tortured, you know, by physicians for mental illness. And they, they'd lock you in boxes and light you on fire and squirt you with hoses, you know. Uh, to me, there, there has to be some direction to what you're doing. And with her, I had to hypnotize her and get her, uh, you know, to, 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 to wake up and do something. Because her husband was nailing windows closed and doors, hiding the car keys. But apparently, unconscious and asleep, she was more clever than her husband. But she told me, she said, you know, I used to live in this great neighborhood. And I knew everybody in the neighborhood. And we were all friends. And I married this real estate agent and he struck it rich. So we moved to this big gated community and she goes, I was lonely, I didn't know anybody. I started fantasizing about moving back to where I used to live. And my husband took me to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist said I wasn't in touch with reality. They started giving me electric shock treatments. And she said, and it seemed to cycle. The more I got, the worse I felt, the more I would wanna fantasize about getting out of there which made sense to me, uh, I don't know about you, but if somebody was holding me down and putting electricity through my head, I would be fantasizing about getting out of there. She didn't seem crazy, but I guess, you know, when she would fall asleep that, you know, something was telling her to get the fuck out of there and wake up and move. Uh, and, uh, you know, I said to her, I said, why don't you try an experiment? And her husband was actually in the waiting room and I brought him in I said, I wanna try an experiment see if we can get your wife over all of this. I said, you're a real estate agent. I said, do you have any houses in her old neighborhood? And he said, and he said, he says, actually, I own seven of them. You know, and he said, I rent them out. I said, have you got one that's empty? And he said, no, but I have one where the lease is coming up. And I said, why don't you let her move back in her neighborhood for a while and see if she wakes up at night, throws herself in the ocean? Because she was happy back there. And, uh, well, you know, if she doesn't throw her and he goes, well, he goes, who's going to watch her in the middle of the night? And I thought, oh, so he's not willing to make sacrifices. Oh. And I said, we'll hire someone to do that. And of course, uh, she, he hired somebody to do that. And he hired some friend of his. And uh, they went back. And she didn't wake up in the middle of the night and go throw herself in the ocean. In fact, uh, turned out the person that was keeping an eye on her was a lawyer. He ended up filing for divorce. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He ended up with half his wealth and a nice house in the neighborhood she wanted to live in. Yeah. <laughs> so, wasn't a good outcome for him, but it sure was for her. Yeah, true. So uh, uh, one uh, more question here. Uh, is there something or anything you think most NLP practitioners or master practitioners miss or misunderstand? Oh, Lord, that's a long subject. Okay. <laughs> Something specific. Yeah, I don't think people get the importance of sensory acuity. Uh, they think once they see access and cues, they know what they mean, and they still interpret behavior. Uh, that, to me, if you ask enough questions of someone, they almost tell you how to help them. And, you know, that... If you're not trying to explain or justify whatever behavior they don't like or society doesn't like, and instead you find out, you just find out how it works, then altering it is not that hard. If the pictures are too big, you make them smaller. If, you know, if they have a memory that makes them feel bad, you run it backwards. You're trying to get the neurology itself to do something different. And that's that whole Virginia Satir thing about having a choice. If somebody's hallucinating dead babies on hot dogs, my first response is they got too much time on their hands. Uh, that's the first thing that crosses my mind. They just got way too much time on their hands. Their neurology can spin around in a circle and do this. I need their neurology busier doing other stuff. I need them to, you know, I need them to start thinking, well, if I got out of here, what job would I get to start with? And what job would I want to work towards? And how would I want to go to school and educate myself? What books should I be reading? You know, what should I be doing so that I become the kind of person that I want to be? 
you know, I, and I, I mean, I've literally asked a schizophrenic in a hospital who told me that they didn't think they were ever going to get out. I said, great, that's one thing you could think. But if you thought about if you got out into a halfway house, what employment would you want to get? What job would you want to have? If you were the guy that became the most successful patient, if I could reach over and just touch you and your everything changed and you became the most successful client I ever had, where would you end up, right? And, you know, I've had people tell me, well, you know, I have a wife and a family and a job and I go, what kind of a job, what would you do? And they go, you know, and sometimes they can't think of things so I have to make suggestions. Um, you know, I don't know if you heard the story, but uh, there's a story I tell a lot about a guy who was in a mental hospital, you know, who was talking to the devil and, uh, you know, and literally his wife came to me in a seminar and she came up and she said, I don't think my, every time I go to see my husband, he's worse. He's gotten to the point where he barely recognizes me. All he talks about is his conversations with the devil. And, you know, the psychiatrist says he's having a complete breakdown. And uh, so me, you know, I went out and got some Gothic book in some foreign language. I think it was Portuguese actually. <laughs> But it looked really demonic, and I took the cover off of it and put a sales training manual inside of it, uh, you know, and uh, for selling life insurance. And uh, I just happened to have it because I'd been doing sales training at the place, and I stuck it inside this big ass leather cover with a big symbol on the outside. I have no idea what the book was actually about, but it was this big, just like a sales training binder, and. Uh, you know, I, I, I went, they had them taken out of the room. I went in, I owned the physics company at the time. We went in and put hydraulics in there, you know. Again, they'd seen the exorcist, put some lasers outside, smoke machines, the whole nine yards. And, you know, and, and when he went to sleep, you know, at night, we, we gave him a little sleeping pill and, you know, went in and put, put all kinds of things in the room, you know, put the book in the room you know, and took the window bars and made them so that they would pop open. And when he finally did wake up in the middle of the night, it was because we put speakers in the wall and went, Charlie, and he sat up in bed and the bed began to rumble and doors opened and closed. You know, I'd seen the exodus. I knew how this was done. And when he walked over, you know, because the voice was over by the window, he walked over to the window, the window bars literally popped off. He was on the second floor. And this holographic image that I bought from Edmund Scientific of, uh, you know, somebody had a statue of the devil and we had it move through the clouds and I had martial amps up in the trees and reverb because you can't do mnemonic things without reverb. Charlie, <laughs> I, I, and he goes, and he goes, is that you? And I said, yes, it's the devil. And he went, you sound different schizophrenic but not stupid and I said yes that's because I'm really pissed off you've been talking to other people about our conversations so I'm going to send you to the hell where you get skinned alive which is an oxymoron if you're dead you wouldn't be alive but you know he wasn't that smart and I went you know you'll be skinned alive inch by inch every night over and over and over again or you'll read my book and spread my word. And a light came on across the room and here's this big book. And he opened it up and it says, Century 21, you know, life insurance sales training manual. And he sat there reading the book. And as he was there, it's a glass of water. He eventually dripped it off. And when he woke up, still leaned over the book, there suddenly next to him is at one of these little stands they have in hotel rooms with a three-piece suit and wingtip shoes <laughs> and a brush and all these things which weren't in his room. He didn't have those kind of amenities. They had to go to a, so he combed his hair and put on his suit. And when the nurse came in the morning to give him his medication, and we had cameras in there watching this and it was hysterical because they'd knock on the door twice and take the key and open the door. And he's standing right in front of the door with a briefcase all decked out in a three-piece suit with wingtip shoes. And he goes, Betty, it's so nice to see you. I've been worried about you, Betty.
And she looks at him and she goes, Charlie, is that you? And he goes, yes, Betty, it's me. You know, you have two children. Have you really ever stopped and thought about what would happen to them if you passed away? And Betty went, no. And then the, the, the doctor walks in and he goes, Betty's still halfway in and out there. He goes, Betty, is there a problem there? And he goes, Dr. Eldridge, I've been thinking about you. <laughs> and this conversation starts to go on. And then two guys show up at the door with sunglasses in dark suits. And they come and they go, Charlie, we're here to take you. And Charlie goes, to take me? And he goes, yes. You know, because all of his rantings from the devil were paranoid stuff. And he goes, yes, we've been sent by him. Right. And the psychiatrist goes, who are you guys? And, uh, you know, the other psychiatrist that was in on this with us finally comes up and tells them they all have to leave. And Charlie goes, you have to go with them. And we took him to, to a sales training camp to sell life insurance. And, you know, Charlie never did talk about the devil after that. But Charlie went back to his wife and his kids, never mentioned the devil again, became a good provider. In fact, in the United States, if you sell more than a million dollars worth of life insurance face to face, you become a member of the million dollar round table. And he was a member for years. Um, it was, you know, one might say he was possessed. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So we have uh, one uh, request from many uh, here. Is it possible that you do some kind of group exercise or some trans work with us all? Yeah, we could do that. Um, I, I tell you what, why don't you all take your hands and put them together like this. Lock lock your fingers together, press your palms together and squeeze as tight as you can. And keep squeezing and squeezing. And then open your two fingers up, just your index fingers with your palms still touching. So you're pressing your palms together. Look between those two fingers. And as you look further and further between them, your fingers will start to get sucked together. And as they get closer and closer, take a deep breath in through your mouth Close your eyes, breathe out through your nose, slowly. Another deep breath in, relax your hands and let them drift down. And take a quick breath in, slowly let it out through your nose and just relax. Go inside and start to drift through thoughts. Think of some past memory, which is pleasant something with a smile attached to it. I know psychotherapists like to have bad memories, but put those aside for a moment and just think about something. See what you saw when you were there and start to relax your forehead, relax your shoulders, relax your chest, and keep smiling. In fact, see what you saw when you were there, hear what you heard. There are many memories from your past. There are birthdays, there are There are times you stomped in mud puddles. Your childhood, even if it had bad stuff, had some good past pleasant memories where you smile. Maybe the first time you saw a child being born. Any time and place in your past now, remember something that made you feel good and then double the size of the memory and feel better and keep relaxing. Because you see, as you listen to me now, you don't know how you're understanding my words. Your unconscious does it. And the more your unconscious is able to decipher my language, this is the marvelous thing. We, we think everything is done consciously, but consciousness is like a flashlight in a dark room. It only shines on one thing. And even though you're listening to me talk about consciousness, your unconscious is enabling you to know what I'm saying. It's unconscious understanding, unconscious learning. And you're still learning and still understanding because as you listen to me now, your unconscious understands more than you do about relaxing and learning. 
See, our days are full of thoughts and worries and opening and closing jars and refrigerators and doors. Most all of this is done unconsciously. And we learn some things which cause us pain and some things which make us happy. Fortunately for you, I believe the happy thought you're thinking about, the smile that's attached to it, is the very foundation of learning to have a better life. The more we focus and make bigger the pictures of good things, and when we think about things that make us feel bad or things we're worried about, oh, how am I gonna get through this? Is the virus after me? Shrink those pictures down as small as you can and replace them with good memories. And then ask yourself the big important question. How much pleasure could I stand? The answer to that is in the future. Because the nice thing about the future is it's coming. And the nice thing about the past is that it's over. A lot of people forget that. They think the past is still going on because they can think about it and feel bad, feel frustrated, feel regret, if only, if only, if only. But if you think the past is over, done and finished, and you go, hmm, it's a great human sound, hmm. Because when you go, hmm, that starts your brain a thinking. You know, when we finish a meal, we push back and we sigh, we go, Ah, take a deep breath and sigh. And when you do know the past is over and go, hmm, and think, what would I like to be like in the future? See yourself at some future date being more motivated, more excited, more determined, understanding more about NLP. Because reading a few books and taking a class, that's kindergarten. I know a lot of people come up to me and tell me they are a practitioner. Me, I'm still practicing. I figure there's a lot left for me to learn about people and what makes them function and what makes them dysfunctional in this world. There's a lot of both. You know, our president thought that understanding, so he understood that he didn't like what Trump was doing. So he went back and removed all the things on the border wall and people began flooding across. And it, he doesn't want to call it a crisis because if you call it a crisis, he has to admit he made a mistake. Me, I'm the opposite. When I make mistakes, I go up, oh, I don't have to repeat that. Making man's mistakes is the foundation of learning. Understanding that we do stupid things. When I get a client of mine to think, that they do this, think about this thing for a minute here and two minutes there and three minutes here. And it adds up to 30 minutes. And therefore it's 1500 hours in a year. And, oh, good Lord. Then suddenly at 10 years, it's 15,000. And then 40 years, it's 60,000. I always look at them and go, does that sound smart? They always sheepishly look at me and go, no. And I go, good. That means you can take a deep breath, ah, sigh, and get be done with it. And then say to yourself, what would I like to be? Who do I want to be in the future? It's not being there that's great. It's getting there that's great. What do I have to do to become exquisite at the skills that I've learned in NLP? Well, one, you have to see more. You have to hear more. You have to listen more. You have to read a little bit, a lot of books to read, not just NLP books, but things about how our neurology works or doesn't. Now, a lot of the things you read about neurology talk about, well, somebody had a stroke, so therefore this part of their brain does that. Well, that's the logic of saying, if I cut a wire in a TV and the picture goes fuzzy, it's the wire that keeps it clear. It's just not intelligent. Intelligence is looking at what works and repeating it and looking at what doesn't work and going, oops, enough of that. So when you do things that work, and especially when it has to do with relaxation, those of you that want to go deeper, 
let your internal dialogue talk to you in a sleepier voice. And you say the word relax, make sure it sounds like a command. In English, questions go up, statements go across, and commands go down. So when you're relaxing, you say relax, really relax. When I say you're unconscious, it's a command. Good hypnotists know this. When they say you're unconscious, wants to learn, your unconscious understanding, your unconscious is a command. It means your conscious mind is not going where it normally goes. Now, if you take your smile and you start and just wiggle your toes, wiggle your toes a little bit. And you see, you might as well start at the bottom and work your way up. Because if you can start smiling at your toes and smile on your legs and smile all the way up through your chest to the corners of your mouth and smile till you show teeth, really smile and then start to spin it in a circle, spin it in a circle, take a deep breath, open your eyes and say to yourself, I'm gonna spend more of my day smiling, less of my time remembering and more of my time thinking, then every day will get better. Oh, great. Thank you. So the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> yes, I can do a trance. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Uh, got a question here. Uh, can NLP be an alternative for medicine uh, within psychology? Is a question from one of well, psychologists, there's a lot of medication they give people. Uh, I'm a firm believer in antibiotics, for example. I think antibiotics is one of the great medicines. Um, uh, I have lung issues as a result of COVID, and they gave me a rescue inhaler, great medicine. But when you start trying to solve, quote, psychological problems with medicine, uh, I, I, I find ADD medicines and uh, depression medicines and a lot of these things. And unless you really understand the neurochemistry and it's really adjusting the neurochemistry. When I started out, uh, psychiatrists would say to me, they would say, there were a couple of things they said to me. Uh, one was like, he had a nervous breakdown and I would go, which nerve broke? And, you know, they would go inside and drop into a trance and very often not come out because that, you know, that's too intelligent of a question. And they meant it idiomatically. And that's an idiom is like the apple of your eye. It's not really an apple and it has nothing to do with your eye. It means it's the thing you want the most. And when they said a nervous breakdown, they really meant it idiomatically, which meant really if it's an idiom, it means you don't know. It just means they're acting profoundly different. I had a, a client once that was referred to me because he jumped on top of his desk and started screaming snakes. He'd never done it before. He wasn't really a crazy person. He was the CEO of a large communications company. And so they took him to the emergency ward, strapped him down and pumped him full of drugs. Uh, unfortunately, when the drugs wore off, he went right back into the same state. So they put him in a mental hospital in a padded room. So now we have a guy hallucinating snakes in a straitjacket in a padded room strapped down. So he screamed louder because he couldn't get away from the snakes. Uh, I mean, he, giving him drugs is, is not really going to solve the problem because they can get him to relax, almost go catatonic by sedating him, meant that he alternated between being catatonic uh, relatively catatonic, not entirely, but relatively catatonic and screaming snakes and flipping out and, and what they call a psychotic episode. If we're going to give people drugs, we have to understand the neurochemistry enough to know that we're balancing the neurochemistry and to decide that there, is, that's, there isn't a better way. 
uh, I worked a lot with the neurologist. And so I would send people in for blood screens. And uh, sometimes we would run as many as 100,000, uh, you know, which seems enormous, but I wanted to make sure there was no, nothing seriously wrong, you know, a tumor in the brain or something like that. One time I sent a guy in and it turned out he had shrapnel in his head. They did some CAT scans and uh, he had shrapnel left over from the Korean War that was working its way out and it was giving him auditory hallucinations. And I had actually read in a psychiatric book once that, that was written during World War II that shrapnel caused auditory hallucinations. And so we have to look for those things and make sure that it, when it's biochemical, one of these clients that I sent who was having auditory hallucinations, serious auditory hallucinations, they heard people that were in front of them screaming at them when they weren't saying a word. And uh, when they tested it, turned out their potassium was so low, their heart shouldn't be beating anymore. Oh. And uh, so the solution, because when I looked at the results and the neurologist told me, I asked the neurologist, I said, did you give him potassium? And he said, well, I wanted to talk to you first. And I said, well, let's do this. I went in and got two bananas and an avocado and made him eat them. And his auditory hallucinations subsided. And uh, so it really turned out to be dietary. And uh, that, you know, when we're talking about issues and saying they're just psychological, nothing is just psychological. And when we say there's a chemical imbalance in somebody's brain, we have to, I always ask the doctors, I go, what chemicals? Have you tested them? What chemical balances, what's imbalance? And 50 years ago, we didn't have the machinery, the devices, nor the blood screening to be able to determine that at, with any degree of accuracy. It's a lot better now. So uh, to me that, you know, sometimes it, the easiest solution is to give people uh, you know, antipsychotics, but it doesn't necessarily address the issue. Uh, and I want to make sure people don't have brain tumors. And then if there's a chemical imbalance, I want to do everything I can to find out what it is and to find out if it could be adjusted psychological, because the answer to the gentleman's questions is sometimes we can adjust it with, by, with hypnosis, with inducing powerful states of consciousness, uh, you know, uh, that sometimes tremendous oxytocin will relieve these things. I mean, they found out that by artificially giving people oxytocin when, you know, when they were autistic and were always pushing everybody away, that it, it, it's not just a happiness hormone, that it's a pattern recognition hormone. They began to tell the difference between an angry face and a happy face. So therefore, by raising the level of oxytocin, and of course, this can be done by people having fun as opposed to taking it with a needle. Uh, you know, there are some things, of course, diabetics have to have insulin. And when they're a type one diabetic, they have to have insulin or they'll die. It's not that drugs are bad, it's that they're given indiscriminately. And to me, it, even if you're gonna in, start out relieving symptoms with drugs, we should be working towards trying to find out what the mental chemical imbalance is. And is it neurotransmitters that are imbalanced? Is it, you know, uh, I mean, if it's something as simple as potassium, then, you know, a few avocados will do the trick. Um, sometimes there are allergies. I uh, had somebody who couldn't eat things with potassium because they were allergic to, to bananas and avocados and anything because they didn't get rid of potassium. Uh, but these, these are the kinds of things that are done through neurotesting and uh, th there's a real difference between psychological testing and chemical testing. And to me, I, I, I believe the science. Uh, I, I don't believe all scientists. Uh, that would be a dangerous thing to do. Uh, I would always, if I were him, I would assume that it could be done psychologically and find out how good you can make it. If you run the neuro tests and find out what what chemical imbalance is there, or if you find out you can't get that answer, I, I would assume that if they spent more time in states where, where they felt good 
you know, especially with what they now call, uh, it used to be called manic depressives, they're called bipolar. Now I don't know that changing the name did any good, but uh, apparently people liked being manic better than being depressed. So they changed it to bipolar so that they sounded as good on either side that especially people who have you know been on lithium for years and years and years incredibly hard on the kidneys and and uh they keep having to increase the doses uh there's a place here in texas where lithium is in the water and the indians called it crazy water and you can buy it online and it's naturally naturally absorbs lithium into the system but when you start concentrating lithium and giving it to people who are bipolar, rather than working on them, learning to control their states so they don't get too depressed or too manic so that they become more stable, this can be done hypnotically. I've done it. Uh, I didn't say it was easy, but it can be done. That would be my answer. Experiment and find out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's been great having you. Uh, we're so happy that you agreed to do this for us in Sweden. Well, Sweden is a, number one, it's a very educated country. And I, one of the things I found out about people like you that I've met is that people that come from Sweden generally are a little bit more practical and a little bit more open to ideas. Uh, there are some places on the planet where that's not terribly true. And some of them are right here in the United States, you know. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in California, but they're all very religious about it. Uh, you know, I couldn't live there anymore and function. It's become so ridiculous with all this political correctness nonsense. And, you know, that, you know, if you don't agree with me, you must be a racist. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's ludicrous kind of thing, thinking. And people, you know, sometimes I found this out with all this, you know, I studied like 160 different psychotherapies and some of the people were so religious that this was just the only right way to treat a patient, even when they got no results. Uh, that, you know, ideas can be doorways to new realities, but they can also be chains. And to me, when ideas are used as chains and, and your culture is a, a little more flexible. And so it's a pleasure to talk to y'all. <laughs> it's been great. And uh... People keep writing in the in the chat here how much we appreciate this and well, very appreciated uh, from everyone here. Well, thank you so, very much for listening you. to my rantings. <laughs> we love it. You know that. <laughs> so thank you. I, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Bandler. Fantastic. Thanks so much. It's been great.